Well, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. Uh, last week marked an important day in the state's history. But as I said last Wednesday, the conversation about public safety is not over. We have more work to do to keep our kids and our communities safe. Immediately following the averted Fairhaven incident, I directed the Department of Public Safety and all available resources, including state and local law enforcement, uh, to conduct a statewide school safety audit. Those assessments were undertaken over the last several weeks, and I'm pleased to say they've been completed. I'd like to thank the Department of Public Safety, all local and county law enforcement, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and all school officials and personnel for their swift and diligent action. As I've said many times, public safety is the primary function of any government. And as far as I'm concerned, it rises to the top and is our number one responsibility. Just yesterday, I had the opportunity to meet with students, teachers, and parents from Fairhaven. It's very obvious and understandable. There's a lot of apprehension and fear amongst the community. So I want parents across the state to know we are doing everything we can to keep their kids safe. And I want students to know we've heard you and agree you should not have to worry about your own safety when you walk into your school. As my team will share, we have strong protocols in place in many schools, but there are various communities and school buildings where additional work and efforts are needed. As governor, I have a responsibility to provide for the safety of our citizens, especially our kids, which is why I asked the, the legislature to appropriate $5 million to fund school safety grants. I'm happy to report the legislature is booking $4 million in the capital bill, which I hope will pass in, in the very near future. And the other $1 million will come out of the Homeland Security grants through the Department of Public Safety. The goal is to have a grant process be conducted in a relatively short time frame to ensure a majority of the work can be completed before students return this fall. I'd like to uh, now, at this time, turn it over to Commissioner Anderson, Acting Secretary Boucher, and Rob Evans, a Vermont School Safety Liaison Officer, to report on the school security assessments and to provide the details of the school grants process and timeline. Thank you, Governor. I'll be bashful. Yeah, well, good afternoon, everyone. Tom Anderson, Commissioner of Public Safety. Um, several weeks ago, Governor Scott proposed a multi-pronged strategy to keep Vermont schools and communities safe. Frankly, in my view, it was a demonstration of political courage that is rarely seen, and I thank him for his leadership on this issue. As the governor stated, one of his primary objectives is to make sure that we are doing all we can to keep our schools as safe as possible. In connection with this goal, he directed the Department of Public Safety to, to conduct a statewide school safety uh, audit. Uh, the Agency of Education has been our partner in this, and I thank you, Heather. In about a four-week period, uh, 172 law enforcement officers from 50 local police agencies, seven sheriff departments, uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and every single Vermont State Police barracks fanned out across the state and worked collaboratively with school administrators to complete these assessments. All told, 422 schools in Vermont took part in the assessments. I'm deeply grateful to the, the police chiefs and the sheriffs for their assistance. We could not have done this without them. I also want to publicly thank Rob Evans and Emily Harris, uh, who handled the school safety. They handled the school safety issues for the Department of Public Safety and the Agency of Education, as well as the school crisis team. They have been the backbone of this project and responsible for creating the survey, collecting the data, and then distilling all of the data and reporting the results. We've provided a three-page summary of the results of the assessments. They're over here, the handouts over here. Overall, the results show we are doing a lot of things very well in Vermont schools and that they're taking safety planning very seriously. The results also show that some er there, there are some areas that we can do better. Here are some of the findings. 96% of the schools in the study have taken part in some form of emergency management planning uh, preparedness activity within the last year, and most expressed a desire to do even more. 96% comply with the state school emergency drill schedule. 83% of Vermont schools lock exterior doors on days when schools are in session. Nine out of 10 schools educate faculty, staff, and students on emergency response protocols prior to the beginning of each school year. 86% uh, 
of schools have the ability to make an internal public address announcement when an emergency is occurring. Just last year, the Vermont School Safety Center recommended that schools develop a family reunification plan in the event of an emergency. This study shows that 86% of the schools have developed or are developing such a plan. That's pretty good, given it was just a, a last year that that was implemented. 85% of the schools have a system to identify, report, and evaluate school threats or concerning behavior. 71% of the schools are utilizing the Vermont School Crisis Guide, which serves as a template for school emergency operation plans. Uh, equally important, the study also identified some areas for improvement in schools. <clears throat> While 80% of schools can lock some internal classroom and office doors from the inside, 70% do not have the ability to lock all doors from the inside. Why is that important? Well, without this ability, doors are either left unlocked or need to be locked from the outside. And logic would tell you locking from the outside may not keep someone out. Um, so that obviously, it could potentially pose uh, harm to individuals within the school. Um, as I noted earlier, the majority of schools have the ability to notify those inside the building of a danger with a public address system. However, half of all schools lack the ability to make the same announcements to people on the outside of the building. So we have the ability to do it on the inside, we're lacking the ability to do it on the outside. Half of Vermont schools do not require, do not require faculty or staff to wear identification tags or credentials during the school day. That should be standard policy across the state. 44% of schools have not communicated with parents or guardians about what they should do and what they should not do during an emergency. Educated parents are extremely important. Parents that know what to do in an emergency are mu much more likely not to hinder emergency type uh, activities. Uh, we also made certain recommendations. The Secretary of Education and I made certain recommendations to the governor following the assessments, and those include the following. Uh, first, we're recommending that before the beginning of the next school year, the Vermont School Safety Center provide all schools an updated list of school safety best practices that will include things like access control, visitor management, exterior door labeling, interior door locking, uh, public address systems, internal communication systems, mass notification systems, and parent guardian communications. We have recommended that there be further development of school crisis plans to ensure schools are prepared to respond to a wide range of hazards uh, and threats. We are recommending that there be additional training to provide schools, including active shooter response, behavioral threat assessment, and incident command training courses. With respect to the planning and training, we are recommending that the Department of Public Safety utilize $1 million in Homeland Security funding to support schools in creating and updating school crisis plans and significantly enhance training and exercise programs. With regard to the anticipated capital funding for, the, uh, for grants to, to enhance school security measures, we are recommending that the Agency of Education, the Department of Public Safety, the Vermont School Safety Center, and, and our school safety partners develop a list of recommended equipment and technology uh, upgrades to schools that schools should consider when applying for these grants. We recognize that each school is unique. Each school it will be encouraged to look at the list and develop the best type of plan that they have for, this, uh, for, these, for these grants. Finally, let me just briefly discuss the grant process. Uh, the $4 million in grant money the governor has requested the legislature appropriate will be earmarked to make security upgrades to school facilities. So these will be more infrastructure type uh, projects. Uh, this money will be for things, as, as I just mentioned, things like uh, security cameras, advanced door locking systems, and communication tools like PA systems and, and radios. Um, the, the governor is committed to getting these grants out to the schools as quickly as possible. Our goal is to award the capital grants by August 1st, uh, so they're, they're, they'll have them before the beginning of the school year. Uh, schools should look for the grant application no later than June 1st. We're going to try to get it out sooner than that, but it'll be no later than June 1st. Um, and we'd encourage schools to actually start looking at it now. Uh, they, they, they completed the surveys. They know really where their, where their uh, security needs lie. Um, over the next month, we will be engaged in, a, we will engage a working group with representatives from the school community, emergency services, and the state of Vermont to assist in developing the grant application cr criteria. What you're going to do to apply for the grant, what types of things you can apply for. And this would be, again, for the, the infrastructure upgrades to the schools. 
Uh, as I said, in addition to the $4 million, an additional $1 million of federal homeland security funding will be made available. This money will be directed toward planning, training, and exercise support for the schools. I'll turn it back over to the governor. Thank you. As I said on February 22nd, when I laid out the multi-level action plan with gun safety being only a part of it, I'm hopeful Vermonters will join in the responsible discussion we must have about ways to reduce the underlying violence in our society in order to keep kids safe in our schools and our communities. Our goal will be to find real solutions and to take steps that will make a difference. I'm sure these conversations will be passionate and the solutions will not be easy but they are important to our children, our communities, and to ensuring we remain the safest state in the country. While gun safety and school security can be part of the conversation, we must also focus on the root causes of violence. That is why today I'm creating by executive order the Community Violence Prevention Task Force. This group will be charged with identifying and recognizing the primary root causes of behavior which lead to violence against others in schools and communities. They will also lead the state's response to address these issues by ensuring full interagency and interagency coordination among state and local governments and schools. The task force will assess research and data already available to determine the underlying causes of violent behavior in our communities. Two, as requested by the House of Representatives, review any connection between excessive video game playing and the propensity to engage in violence. Three, identify best practices for schools and communities to prevent violent behavior, including, but not limited to, identifying warning signs and how to report them, recommending ways to improve prevention and report, <coughs> report of bullying and harassment and closing the operational gaps among the Department of Children and Families, the Department of Mental Health, the Agency of Education, law enforcement, and our schools. Four. Identify opportunities to strengthen existing support systems to ensure every school and community has a local rapid reaction early intervention team involving educators, mental health, social service professionals, and law enforcement when concerning behavioral issues are identified. Five, review opportunities for expanding school safety prevention and preparedness capacity in the Agency of Education and the Department of Public Safety and, and supporting the work of the Vermont School Safety Center. Six, evaluate the adequacy of protections for individuals, including students and adults who report threats. Seven, explore the feasibility of stronger open source intelligence gathering by the Vermont Intelligence Center and the Cybersecurity Center with Norwich University once established. And eight, review existing state health, mental health, education and criminal laws, regulations, policies and programs and propose appropriate legislative changes, including changes to eliminate redundancy and break down barriers faced by communities and schools in coordinating action with state government. The task force will consist of not more than 14 members from within and outside of state government. The state members will include the Commissioner of Public Safety, the Secretary of the Agency of Human Services and uh, Health, the Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health, the Agency of Education School Security Liaison Officer, and the Secretary of the Agency of Digital Services or Designees. The remaining appointees to the task force will be broadly representative of stakeholders and may include, but not limited to, mental health care professionals, teachers, students, school officials, sportsmen, and or licensed gun dealers, veterans, security consultants, healthcare providers, first responders, state's attorneys, and cybersecurity professionals. This group will be asked to report back on pre preliminary findings and the recommendations this December. The unfortunate bottom line is that this world is ever-changing and we need to do whatever we can to keep Vermonters safe. So with that, I will sign uh, this executive order establishing this uh, Governor's Community Violence Task Force. And I'll do that right now. Can 
I thank all of you for your good work and look forward to a very productive conversation. With that, we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have in regards, uh, regards to this, uh, this situation, this issue. What sort of oversight will there be to make sure it's In terms of the surveys, the assessments that have been yeah, made? So, you know, some, some of these things, need to make changes, that kind of thing. So oh. Yeah, so, so the way, in the grant application, there's going to be specific criteria as to what can be applied for, what type of equipment can be, can be applied for. I think our goal is to have a list of, of, of equipment that fits the, the requirements of the capital bill, fits the requirements of uh, what are known as school safety enhancements for our infrastructure, and then limit those as to what the schools can, can request. And during our, during our process, those will be administered by the Department of Public Safety, and we will have an audit process to make sure that the schools are spending the money for what they said they were going to spend the money for. Uh, so it's not we're asking for cameras and then we're spending it on a roof. Uh, so we will, there will be an audit process as part of, our, as part of the DPS uh, um, grant, uh, grant administration. Are they required to ask for money to do the things that you've identified them not doing? I think we're going to work with, I think in the, in the criteria, I mean, we're still working through the criteria, but we will be work, looking to make sure that the schools are addressing the types of things that, you know, were identified in the surveys as being a problem. And particularly if we had, with respect to specific schools, we'll be also be looking at that. So when, we, when we're reviewing the grants and deciding what grants to give out to whom, uh, those are the types of things I'm, I'm confident we'll be looking at. Sure. So there, it, it could be things like security cameras. It could be it could be things like locking mechanisms for doors. It could be things like PA systems that that go both inside and outside of a school. Uh, that that's an important component. So there'll be it, it's things like that. And, and I think we identify them in both the memo and the uh, uh, the handout that I'm giving you. The types of things we're looking at that would be really infrastructure improvements uh, that really go towards security of the schools. Was there a four or five million dollars enough to take care of the problem? Uh, I guess I guess you know the the, the capital bill has a twenty five thousand dollar cap on the uh, on the grants uh, right. on the house version at this point. right which is in the Senate so it's four million dollars with a twenty five thousand dollar grant uh, cap uh, on on the grants and you know we're hopeful that's going to go a long way in, in in creating some of the or purchasing some of the infrastructure improvements that we need so I guess we all have to wait and see a little bit on some, that. but not. I, I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm not prepared to say that that you know they wouldn't it wouldn't address them all. Is there is there a pattern with the schools that are doing worse than others? Are they small schools, rural schools? Or? I, I'm not sure. I, I I can answer that question just on the data. You know the the compiling of the data without okay. mining it down a little. I, I can't answer that question right, right now. And is the figure four or five million? It's five about. million, four million out of the capital bill, one million uh, dollars uh, that will be uh, utilized through public safety. With did Homeland that, Security grants. Did anything jump out and alarm you about what the audit found? Uh, not that I uh, had seen uh, in terms of uh, the types of measures that, that uh, they need, uh, but uh, but possibly I don't know if there's any reaction yeah, I think from I Rob or yeah. from. Yeah, and certainly I can speak to a little bit. I, I appreciate the dialogue from schools about the need for more training, uh, active shooter response, and all hazards process for school emergency preparedness. But things like locking mechanisms, that every classroom or office space has the ability to lock from the inside, as the commissioner had said. Outdoor internal um, public address system, speaker system, so everybody in the community can be notified uh, when a school emergency is taking place. Those are the things that aren't just utilized when an active shooter situation is uh, taking place, but when any type of emergency is taking place. And, and we want to make sure that we're spending money not only on the response side, but on the prevention side as well, because certainly the mo money well spent on the prevention is, is really where, where we want to be on those types of things. But cameras, access control, visitor management, those are some of the best practices that the group will be forming for equipment to be purchased. When it comes to things like locks and doors, are there any conflicts between the fire code and things that would be helpful for uh, an active shooter situation? Yes, yeah, cer certainly fire code is an issue, so the things and the guidance that we will give is any of those types of mechanisms need to make sure that we're fire code compliant. Um, but we, we talk about that when we talk about those types of response protocols, about some things may have to, you know, everybody has to have an exit strategy, and those locking mechanisms can't keep people from getting out if the best response option is to get out. So there's a variety of things that need to be considered when these types of technologies are being put into place. 
What happens if a, a district or a school looks like it doesn't want to be public? Well, this is certainly their prerogative. Uh, we uh, did the assessments and wanted to uh, give them the flexibility uh, of determining what they, their needs are. They're the ones who are going to have to, uh, to make application uh, for this, uh, for this grant, grant. And uh, so it's totally up to them. I'm sure that Rob uh, will be working with them in the future if they don't take advantage of these and, and uh, identify ways to, to do so. And it I see Jeff and Nicole and, and Jay from the principals and superintendents uh, associations as well as the school boards association. They, we've been in great collaboration with those folks and, and, and the need is, is there and this is an opportunity for folks to be able to do things that maybe they haven't been able to do before. So utilizing those associations and the continuing dialogue that we have, we're just going to reinforce the point that this is important for everybody. Yeah. It, it, we will not be releasing any of the, the data um, mm -hmm. for security, obvious security reasons, uh, but those, uh, those uh, uh, parents uh, will be able to uh, identify with their schools and, uh, and if they seek to, to, uh, to release the information, that would be uh, up to them. Uh, but uh, they're the ones that presented the information, so if parents have questions, they should uh, contact their local, uh, local schools. Um. You have some areas of state that have no cell service. Uh, sometimes it takes a place a long time to respond because of the geography. Will cameras, will a panic button um, stop a parkland? Uh, th that's a question that I'm uh, probably not qualified to answer. Will this, uh, will this help? Uh, we certainly think it will. Um, in terms of cell service, uh, that will be improving over time, uh, particularly uh, with the action we just took. It'll take a few years with the national effort, uh, the first responders, and provide more cell service in some of these rural areas. You said the assessments won't be public. Will the grants be public? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I think the grant amount, the grant awards will probably be public. I mean, we uh, again, for security reasons, we probably wouldn't be making public ex specifically what equipment was purchased uh, with those grants. So again, those are some, some issues we're working through right now. but. I would not anticipate the specific things that are being purchased, again, for security reasons, but the overall grant award, what was awarded to what school uh, may, be pub may be public. Tom, what percentage of schools have an SRO? Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it, it says 21% in there, um, but, but we know that that may be a little bit flawed because I believe the, the, the Vermont Police Academy on the records has about 33 or 34 active school resource officers. That's a formal active school resource officer. Many law enforcement agencies across the state have an informal school resource officer program where folks are invited to come in and have collaborative conversations with local principals and superintendents. So we're going to have to go back in and get the specific data on that, but I think it's probably lower uh, than the 20% than the that's, that's calibrated in the survey there. Not as part of this program. Uh, this is more for capital needs uh, infrastructure, uh, but uh, certainly in the future, we'll have to have conversations about uh, what the school resource officers. Any other questions about this issue? This is the point in time when uh, you may or may not stay. Uh, <laughs> there be other questions, and there may be some questions that you might be able to answer in other regards. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Governor, the State Board of Education Chair said that Rebecca Holcomb left um, concerns about your administration's calls for further cost containment. Did she express those concerns to you and cite them as a reason for her departure? Well, again, uh, this was something that was. Uh, uh, I discussed uh, with uh, Rebecca Holcomb, uh, Secretary Holcomb. Uh, this was for personal reasons. She thought it was the right time for her uh, to move on, and uh, it was all, it was totally her decision. Uh, so did she discuss her concerns she, about the she, she, uh, We spoke uh, about uh, some of the challenges uh, <coughs> over the last number of years uh, she's had in terms of uh, the tough work in Act 46 and so forth. and and some of uh, what the challenges are for the future. Um, 
but uh, again, she decided to move on for personal reasons. She thought this was the right time for her to do so. So your understanding from conversations with her, cost containment did not factor into her decision to leave? I, I, I'm sure there were a number of factors that entered uh, her thought process. Uh, but, uh, but I wouldn't say that that came out as the, any particular reason for my conversation. I, I don't know what conversation she's had with others. Uh, speaking of cost containment, there's only a few weeks probably left in this session. There's still a five cent property tax increase looming out there. Uh, the legislature doesn't seem inclined to take up anything you've suggested thus far. Is there anything else on the <coughs> well, again, we gave them quite a list. Um, we still believe that there's a path forward uh, to accomplishing uh, something uh, to uh, prevent property tax uh, rates increasing this year. And uh, we uh, are uh, fully um, aware as well uh, that there's, uh, there's an opportunity to do so. So we'll continue to work in that regard. Could you explain which thing on that list you think would get to $40 million specifically? Because they said that, you know, just sort of offering that list without sort of specifics on how the savings would be reached this year is not entirely helpful. Well, again, if we go back to the conversations we had a year ago uh, about uh, a statewide uh, health care contract, uh, that uh, I believe is still an opportunity. Uh, in fact, uh, as I understand it, I haven't seen any details yet, but the NEA has come around and decided that this might be an opportunity uh, to do so. Uh, we look forward to the details, and maybe there's some savings that could be booked there. Uh, as well, the, the ratios that I've spoken about in the past are there. Um, and, and there are other initiatives that we could, uh, we could look at um, that I believe would be beneficial. And, and there's a whole list, but, uh, but we'll narrow that down. What's going to work for FY19? Well, again, we may not be able to book uh, immediate savings uh, in terms of of, uh, because I'm not asking, again, uh, the, the schools to go back and, and do anything with their existing budgets. They've done the hard work. They, they, they did what I asked them to do. Uh, but if we could find an opportunity uh, for savings over the next few years, what we'd look at it as an investment, uh, utilizing uh, one-time money uh, this year uh, in order to do that, to keep uh, the rates uh, where they are. So you'd use one-time money? to patch the hole to keep property tax rates level? If, if we can substantiate what the savings will be over the next uh, few years, yes. Right. Where's okay. that one-time money going to come from? There's uh, all kinds of opportunity in a $6 billion budget. Well, can you give us a few examples? Well, it's, it's a very fluid, uh, obviously, and uh, we'll, I'm confident we can find the money. So it won't be easy, but we can find the money. What commitments? that we can buy down those savings legitimately, uh, that we find the savings. The that could be one, right? Uh, ratios could be another, uh, and attrition over time, not, not immediate. Uh, but, uh, but there are a lot of retirements that are going to happen uh, over the next few years. How do we get to a, a ratio that makes sense uh, for Vermont? Using one-time money last year is part of the problem we face this year. Well, Aren't you just compounding things, yeah. taking it down the road? Again, one-time money is a, is, a, is a term of art uh, in some respects. That was money that was in the education uh, fund uh, to begin with. Uh, it wasn't set my initiative. Uh, as you may recall, I had identified $26.5 million in health care savings that I thought uh, would put us on a path uh, where we wouldn't be maybe where we're at today. But Unfortunately, uh, we had to, uh, we had to uh, come to agreement in some respects uh, because I didn't want to go uh, into the new year uh, without any, uh, without any uh, budget bill. Uh, so uh, from my standpoint, <clears throat> I still believe there are opportunities to save that money. In 2014, when you were running for re-election as lieutenant governor, you proposed a, a statewide sort of school budget oversight process of some sort. I may be getting the details wrong, but is that something you still believe is a good step? Well, I believe the right step is uh, for us uh, to work together in some way to, to understand the, the position we're in uh, today. Uh, we know uh, that uh, uh, 25 years ago there were 30,000 more students than there are today. We know we're spending a billion seven uh, today to educate those 76,000 students. Uh, so 
we need to uh, find ways uh, to deliver a, a high quality education uh, while uh, understanding that the infrastructure that we have in place today doesn't match the number of students we have. And so uh, I believe uh, we can get to that point. It's going to take all of us working together in order to do so. Um, but, um, but, but again, I haven't seen, uh, it, it doesn't appear at this point in time uh, that the legislature is, is totally willing uh, to reduce uh, the, the uh, rate of uh, growth in property taxes. So, I believe uh, Vermonters uh, have an interest in that, and, uh, and again, there's a path forward to doing so. So you don't favor the thing you proposed to? Well, uh, I, I, you know, I've proposed a few things over the last even couple of years since becoming governor uh, that haven't exactly taken off. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure that that proposal uh, would have a lot of acceptance. So I try and deal with reality, with what we can do today, and, and I believe that we have a, uh, a path forward. We've identified $75 million worth of uh, uh, savings uh, that could be uh, utilized, and, and I believe we can do so. And get back to, let's focus on the future and this cradle to career uh, type of approach that I think is so important. Uh, more investments in early childhood care and learning, more investments in higher education, but trying to use the $1.7 billion that we've appropriated thus far in doing so. And I, I believe it's achievable. Uh, but it's going, to, it's going to take all of us uh, pulling together in order to do it. The Senate just voted to override your veto of S-103. Um, can you explain where you see the harm to the economy if that bill does in fact pass into law? Well, there's a, a number of, uh, of factors uh, in, that, uh, in that particular bill. And I laid out in my veto message a, a path forward where we could agree uh, to certain goals. Uh, but we've already, we're already doing most of what they want with, by executive order and by uh, legislation that was passed in 2014. And uh, for them to turn it around and complicate uh, matters, I think, uh, isn't, uh, isn't uh, something that uh, all of us would accept, and certainly not uh, the, our economy. Uh, I believe uh, that, uh, again, we have a, a, a process uh, in place uh, that is uh, protecting our kids, uh, and, uh, and I believe that we should just continue to do so. If they want to codify the executive order that I put into place, that would be fine. Um, but there are certain aspects of that. And, I, and I'd like to have Peter uh, come up and explain what we're doing today in order to, uh, to satisfy those that don't believe we are. Thank you, Governor. In response to uh, uh, testimony last year on S-103, which we were supportive of moving forward with Interagency Committee on Chemical Management, the Governor, through Executive Order last summer, established the Interagency Committee on Chemical Management. Uh, we have been meeting since this fall. We have conducted a thorough review of the chemical man uh, overall chemical management in the state. And have uh, and are in the process of developing recommendations, which we've shared with the Citizens Advisory Panel, which is also called for in the legislation, which is in part of the executive order. So, uh, in in regards to the ICCM, we're we're doing the work, and we'd like to keep doing the work, and we'd uh, we'd like to work with the the legislature on a path forward to to making sure that that work can continue. Uh, Governor. Um with regard to the, the part of the bill that changes the regulatory process for children's products that contain chemicals, um, is your concern more just generally that that would sour the, the regulatory environment for businesses, or do you see a direct impact on businesses that we would lose jobs because of that bill? Uh, no, I just th th believe that it would sour the relationship uh, now, and that we have a process in place that's working, uh, and that they, uh, they came together in 2014 uh, begrudgingly, uh, both sides came together and came to agreement on, a, on something that does work. And, and I see it's only been in effect in some respects for about a year and a half. So why not let that uh, continue to work? Uh, other aspects of the bill as well, uh, putting so much uh, um, on one person, uh, the, uh, the Commissioner of, of Health. And I might ask uh, Al uh, Gobey to step up and describe the problems with that. Yeah, so thank you, Governor. So Section 8 uh, of the bill uh, concerned us because it basically puts the Commissioner of Mental Health and the, um, and the Commissioner of Health in, uh, you know, sort of a one-person decision-making box, and it 
and the, the bar for the science is too low by my estimation, meaning um, one or two peer-reviewed pieces of scientific literature is, is not a very high bar to make a decision like that. And so two pieces, one, one person having that much power and authority concerns me, and it should concern you. And two, um, the science really matters, and we have to have a higher bar than that. And a process ensures that, the process that Peter and the governor have talked about. And so that's why we were concerned with it. So you're worried about your own commissioner of health having too much authority? In this I, so I would be concerned if I had that that level of authority or if anyone did, meaning... What's the fear and how do they abuse that authority? So, uh, so first of all, I am not a chemical regulation expert or a, uh, someone that does a lot of scientific research. Um, but if you take a look at peer-reviewed scientific literature, it is an advancement of science and advancement of knowledge. Often, later on, there's new information that finds that that was the wrong direction to go in. And so one person with a low bar for the science is a, is a combination that I don't think we want. Having a, if you think about all the processes that AHS has for how we run our agency, it's all councils and boards and citizen engagement. I mean, so to do something where one commissioner has the say with very little scientific evidence is very concerning to me. And I just don't like the process. But, but when you think, wouldn't you think your commissioner of health would have the knowledge and expertise to um, make a informed decision based on the evidence? So I love Mark Levine. And when I was chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, I can quote Lieutenant Governor Phil Scott. He liked me being chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. He wasn't sure what was going to happen after I left. And so if Dr. Levine is there for the rest of his natural life and, on, and even further, then that might be fine. But there will be another one. And so it, this is about policy, not about the person. Um, and I think if you really read it and think about the way that we run our government, we don't do that. And so it, I, I think there needs to be a better process than that. It wouldn't just be the commissioner of health acting there would be the rulemaking process. In your view, is that that's not enough for the safeguard? I, I don't think so. I, I think there needs to be. I, I think that we've created a process in 2014, and everyone said it didn't get off the ground very quick, but it's working now and moving forward. We should let this process work and see how that does, and I think that's a better way. That, that's the Vermont way. Governor, is Deb Bilodeau the right person to lead the Vermont GOP? Well, obviously, um, the majority of Republicans thought so. Uh, she wasn't my choice at that point in time, but um, but she's, uh, you know, I support her. She's uh, she's running the the party at this point. Do you think Vermont needs to be made great again? Well, I think it's a pretty great state uh, as it is, um, and I think it can be better. Uh, but uh, but I'm not sure that that's uh, the term that I would use. So, is the party? doing Republicans uh, any favors by sending out this type of messaging, uh, mimicking the president in a state that is not very fond of the president? Well, again, it wouldn't be the messaging that I would use, uh, but I'm not running the party. But you're happy with who is running the party? Well, I didn't say I was happy, but I think uh, she's, doing a, she's doing what uh, her constituents, uh, those who voted for her, asked her to do. So uh, we'll, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll run uh, the... Uh, the governor's uh, uh, um, office the way I think it should be run, and uh, I'll let her run the party. Do you think it hurts you as a Republican candidate to have that sort of messaging going out? Well, um, certainly. I, I think I've created my own brand, uh, and, uh, and I believe that I'm a, a <coughs> moderate, independent Republican, and I think there are many uh, throughout the state that would identify in that camp. Do you, think it, do you think it might hurt? Uh, the Republicans' chances of either gaining ground in the House this fall or possibly even allowing the Democrats to retake the veto-proof majority? Well, again, uh, it's not messaging uh, that I would utilize uh, considering the popularity of the president in Vermont, uh, but that's, uh, that's not my call. You mentioned building sort of your own brand. Do you see yourself separate from the Vermont GOP at this point? Well, I'm independent by nature, and uh, I've been doing uh, this my entire political life. Uh, so I'll continue to, to march forward with what I think is uh, is right and uh, and continue to do it the way I do it. Will you raise money for the Vermont GOP? I'm going to, if I if if and when uh, I uh, announce my candidacy, I'll be raising money for myself. 
why aren't you or your staff uh, part of sort of discussions going on within GOP? They said, like, as opposed to previous governors, you haven't had anyone take part in conversations about the party's direction. They sort of feel like you're not even trying to. Well, help. we're we're busy um, doing what we need to do in this building and uh, and trying to do what we can for Vermonters. And uh, again, the party, everyone looks at the party apparatus differently. Um, they, uh, they have their own mission, and uh, I, I support their mission, uh, but I have my job to do as well. Are you proud to be a member of the Vermont GOP right now? I'm proud to be a, a Republican. Uh, I'm proud to be myself, and uh, will continue to uh, be myself throughout uh, whatever office I hold. But what about the Vermont GOP specifically? Are you proud of them? Um, you know, I'm proud of Republicans in Vermont. Uh, there are many who don't uh, um, don't identify with the, the party apparatus, uh, but are Republicans. Uh, they, we have a tradition of frugality, uh, try, common sense, uh, smaller government, and I'll continue to try and uh, advocate for that. The Republican Party has encouraged people to run on the gun issue um, and encouraged that kind of energy that's coming from, from some of the Republicans and encourage people to run for office if they're very passionate about against S55, I guess. Um, have, you, have you talked to the party about how to message on the gun issue? I, I haven't uh, spoken to the party about uh, the messaging on that from that aspect. Are you concerned about the role this gun legislation will play in, in politics this year? Um, you know, it's a very emotional, um, very polarizing issue, as we saw last week. And uh, I continue to see um, this is something that uh, um, that I, I believe um, I believe the majority of Vermonters will come to understand that this was the right uh, right step to make. The, you said that she represents the majority of her constituents. That's a very small number of Vermont Republicans who actually voted for her. Do we have a split in the GOP in Vermont? Well, I, you know, again, uh, I've uh, I continue uh, to be my brand of Republican, uh, and uh, and there are many I respect. Uh, the fact that there are many that don't agree with that style or my uh, my views, but uh, but I would say the vast majority of Vermonters do. You ever considered leaving the Vermont Republican no, Party? I have not. Would never run as an independent. No. Um, the VSEA is taking your administration to court over what they say is bad faith negotiating. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, well, I, I I think it's unfortunate, uh, but. Uh, uh, but they'll, they can do uh, what they feel is necessary. Um, it's not, uh, uh, they feel as though uh, we, it's unfortunate we came to the point where we had to go to arbitration, uh, but that was the process uh, that was set forth and, and we adhered to it. So I believe that uh, uh, the, in the end uh, that this was uh, something that uh, the, the board felt that, that we, were, uh, we were on the right side of. Do you think the Labor Board is politically inclined to support your administration over state employees? Uh, I'm not sure uh, about that uh, whatsoever. I think uh, they're, uh, the, the board members are very capable, uh, independently minded, and, uh, and are based, uh, basing their uh, reaction on the, on, the, uh, on the details. Obviously, they thought we were uh, on the right side of that. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming in.